My name is Simmer, and I'm a summer researcher in the NIG group, and I will be filling in as moderator for Emily this week. Today, we will be hearing from Hannah Smith. Hannah is currently a master's student here at the University of Calgary, advised by Walter Herzog. The title of her master's project is The Effect of Nutrition on Musculoskeletal Health and Muscle Integrity. Prior to her master's, Hannah completed a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering here at the University of Calgary. During her undergraduate studies, Hannah worked at Barlin Engineering, a small drilling company for a summer internship. And she has also worked on well abandonment projects. Another summer, she did research in the Stefanischen Group, exploring using instrumented mouth guards to monitor head impacts in professional rugby. Following her master's, Hannah hopes to pursue a medical degree or a PhD program. As a fun fact, in her free time, Hannah enjoys taking care of her horse, Rupert. She also enjoys mountain adventuring with her friends and family. As a reminder, I will first turn it over to Hannah for her presentation, then we will have a Q&A to follow. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and then I'll just put it into presentation mode. Um, and everyone can see my screen and hear me. Yeah, it's all good. Perfect. Um, so thank you again for the introduction. Um, I, uh, my name is Hannah and I'm going to be giving the HPL seminar talk today. And the title of my talk is the effect of nutrition on musculoskeletal health, um, a diet induced obesity model. Uh, so just to kind of introduce myself again and give a little bit of background about who I am and how I got to be here. Um, I graduated from civil engineering at the University of Calgary back in December of 2020. So kind of right um, in the middle of COVID. Um, and during my degree, I did an internship at a small drilling company called Barlon Engineering. Um, and there I worked on writing well abandonment programs, which is kind of the first step to um, decommissioning a well um, and land reclamation. And although this is important work, um, I found that I was uninspired by it um, and realized that my interests were less geared towards traditional engineering and more um, suited towards health and wellness. And so once I got back to school after my internship uh, to begin pursuing these interests, I started taking classes such as anatomy and physiology and human movement, and then also participated in the in a summer research project um, in the human performance lab. And so that's what kind of sparked my interest in research and motivated me to pursue my master's degree in biomedical engineering. Uh, so now I'm currently working under Dr. Walter Herzog. Um, and then when I'm not uh, in the lab or working on my thesis project, some of the things that I enjoy doing are hiking and backpacking in the mountains and then um, riding and taking care of my horse, Rupert, who is in this photo here. Uh, so just to give a little bit of an agenda of what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm first going to talk about some background information, um, as well as some previous work that our lab has done, which kind of sets the stage for where my project fits in. Um, and so then I'll go into my specific aims for my project and then um, talk about uh, some results that I have so far. Uh, so now to kind of get started. And so we all know that diets that are high in fat and sugar often lead to obesity. And obesity is characterized by the accumulation of excessive body fat, and this can lead to a chronic low-level uh, systemic inflammation that predisposes the body to other chronic conditions, such as metabolic syndrome. Uh, metabolic syndrome is the cluster of conditions that include visceral obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and increased fasting glucose, all which put a person um, at a higher risk of uh, complications such as diabetes, um, stroke, um, and other co cardiovascular complications. Uh, but a lesser known fact of obesity is what it can do to the musculoskeletal system. Obesity and metabolic syndrome are risk factors in the development of sarcopenia or muscle wasting. And as muscle wasting is a key indicator of long-term health, uh, it's important to understand this relationship between diet and muscle integrity. 
Muscle tissue undergoes regular remodeling in response to mechanical stimulus during everyday loading. For example, say you're in the gym doing a bicep curl and your muscle experiences a small amount of damage uh, during this movement. This induces inflammation, which triggers the muscle repair process and leads to muscle remodeling and adaptation. Generally, this is regarded to be beneficial and is part of the normal growth and, growth and regenerative process. However, the fact that it is controlled through inflammatory signaling makes it vulnerable to chronic inflammatory uh, to a chronic inflammatory inflammatory environment um, seen in diet induced obesity and metabolic complications. Uh, so what happens is that a kind of cro chronic low level inflammation can impair the normal inflammatory response and regenerative capacity of muscles, um, result in a state of pseudo injury. This in turn uh, can lead to sarcopenic obesity. Sarcopenic obesity is defined as having low muscle mass and quality with an increase in fat mass. This can result in having poor physical and biological function that is associated with disability, loss of activity, altered mechanical loading, and altered biological function due to intramuscular lipid deposition. Because of these effects of sarcopenic obesity, it is likely that it's central to the development of other musculoskeletal pathologies as changes to muscle structural integrity have been seen to occur in as early as three days after the start of a high fat, high sucrose diet. This again indicates that muscle may be among the first musculoskeletal tissues affected by diet induced obesity and inflammation likely plays a substantial role in this loss of integrity. So previous work in our lab has developed and refined a uh, preclinical model of diet-induced obesity using male sprog dolly rats. We have demonstrated that a high-fat, high-sucrose diet induces obesity, as well as low-level systemic and local bone, joint, and muscle inflammation in these sprog dolly rats. Uh, this has led to an increase in fat infiltration and fibrosis in the vastus lateralis muscle. Fibrosis is the deposition of excess collagen and is a feature of abnormal muscle repair. A link has been speculated to exist between um, intramuscular fat and fibrosis in that intramuscular lipid content in skeletal muscles induces local inflammation, which signals the muscle repair process leading to that increased fibrosis and compromised structural integrity. So now I'm gonna walk through um, a couple of studies that our lab has done using interventions that have been known to counteract the effects of obesity to see if they are able to prevent or mitigate the effects of obesity on musculoskeletal degeneration. These interventions that I'm gonna be talking about are prebiotic fiber and aerobic exercise. Prebiotic fiber has been seen to induce changes in the gut microbiota that decreases gut permeability to bacterial lipopolysaccharides or endotoxins, and thus decreasing the amount of systemic inflammation experienced by the body. Uh, the prebiotic fiber has also been known to contribute to the decrease um, in body fat and improve metabolic health in rodents. Uh, exercise is also a very well-known effective modulator of body fat, systemic inflammation, and blood lipid levels. And one of the ways it does this is actually helping to promote the ability of skeletal muscles to use lipids as energy. So the first study that I'm going to talk about here is looking at the effects of diet and exercise interventions on obesity-related knee joint degeneration. So in this study, diet and exercise intervention began at the same time as the obesity induction phase when the animals were 12 weeks old. So at 12 weeks old, animals were randomized into the different intervention groups. Um, and then these interventions were carried, um, carried out throughout 12 weeks. Um, and the different groups uh, included a child control group, a high fat, high sucrose group. Um, and then the interventions um, were the fiber exercise and then one with fiber and exercise combined. Um, and then at 24 weeks of age, these animals were sacrificed and their um, joints were analyzed. Um, so first I have this um, graph here of body fat after the 24 weeks of age. Um, and so we can see here that there is a significant increase in body fat um, of the high fat, high sucrose of the animals that were just in the high fat, high sucrose group 
Um, however, there wasn't, um, however, the animals in the intervention groups weren't far behind. Um, but although um, the intervention groups still uh, had an increase in body fat um, compared to the chow groups, um, the, there are still positive effects um, seen on the metabolic profile data. Uh, so it was seen that all intervention groups um, displayed an increased insulin sensitivity, uh, decreased blood lipid compared to the high fat, high sucrose group. And then there was also that change in the gut microbiota um, that de uh, decreased gut permeability to those um, endotoxins, uh, thus decreasing the systemic inflammation. And so in terms um, of these interventions uh, and how they related to knee joint degeneration, um, they completely rescued um, the knee joint um, from any damage. And so what we can uh, conclude here from this study is that when um, the fiber diet supplement and exercise is started at the same time as the high fat, high sucrose diet, um, there is a complete protective um, effect on knee joint degeneration. And so the next study that we're gonna take a look at um, is also has the same interven interventions, but these were started after a 12 week obesity induction phase. So um, at 12 weeks of old, 12 weeks of age, animals were put on a high fat, high sucrose diet um, for 12 weeks. And then at 24 weeks of age, they were then randomized into um, diet and exercise intervention groups. And then they remained on these interventions for another 12 weeks. And so here again, we have body fat. Um, and at 12 weeks after the um, being on the high fat, high sucrose diet, we can see that there was a significant increase in body fat, which makes sense because they were all on this high fat, high sucrose diet. Um, and then when looking at the uh, data after the 24 weeks, so when the animals were 36 weeks, 36 weeks old, um, there isn't that much of a difference in body fat percentage, especially uh, looking at this fiber group. And so looking at the metabolic data, we did not see the same positive effect as we saw in the last study due to these interventions. Um, so all intervention groups just displayed decreased um, insulin sensitivity and an increased um, blood lipid level. And so this translated also into what we saw in the joints. Um, so when taking a look at the effect this had on knee joint degeneration, it was determined that the interventions were not able to rescue this model. Um, so when the intervention, so we can conclude here that when the interventions were delayed by 12 weeks, um, there was no protective effect observed um, on knee joint degeneration. And so now I'm going to talk about some of the gaps in knowledge from the last two studies that we looked at, um, and then I will go into how I plan on addressing them with my specific goals for my project. So what um, the results tell us from the last two studies is that the timeline or time point that these interventions are introduced is very important um, in being able to rescue this model of diet-induced obesity. And we assume that there is a critical timeline sometime between zero and 12 weeks after the start of the high fat, high sucrose diet where these interventions are able to rescue this model. And so why is timeline so important? Why do we bother looking at the time frame to introduce interventions after the start of the high fat, high sucrose diet if we know that it's effective when it's introduced right at the start? And so uh, the answer to this is clinical relevance. Interventions coinciding with the start of a high fat, high sucrose diet are clinically unrealistic. Individuals who experience obesity due to eating a high fat, high sucrose diet likely do not eat much fiber as part of their regular diet. Thus, um, a fiber diet supplement would be introduced after the onset of obesity and subsequent uh, musculoskeletal problems. Therefore, uh, studying the effects of a delayed um, intervention has more clinical relevance than introducing it at the start of the high fat, high sucrose diet. Um, and so I've been talking a lot about how these interventions have the potential to be effective against joint degeneration due to a high fat, high sucrose diet. And we are speculating that the muscles would also experience this protective effect 
as uh, these interventions have been seen to decrease um, the inflammation. And as I mentioned before, muscles are very vulnerable in this um, inflamed environment. And so additionally, um, as I previously mentioned, um, we established this model of diet-induced obesity, looking specifically at musculoskeletal de degeneration on male sprogdali rats. Um, and in most of the literature out there, um, this model has really only been established with male rats and little work has been done um, looking at musculoskeletal degeneration in female rats. Um, however, uh, other investigators who look at obesity in female rats have reported um, that they tend to get less metabolically sick than the male rats. And so um, I'm interested to see how this translates into changes in muscle integrity. And this brings me to the goals um, of my thesis project. Um, so I will specifically, in terms of interventions, I'll specifically be looking at uh, the fiber diet intervention. I won't be looking at exercise at this time. Uh, so the first goal of my project is to determine the effect of a three-week delayed fiber diet intervention on muscle integrity. Uh, the second goal of my project is to investigate the sex-related differences in muscle integrity in response to the high-fat, high-sucrose diet. And then through these means, hopefully further explore the relationship between uh, inflammation due to diet-induced obesity and muscle integrity. And so this is how um, I'm going to be answering these questions. Um, I have two, or I had two groups of, of rats, both male, uh, 36 male and 36 female rats. Um, and they were further uh, split up into three different experimental groups within the male and female groups. Um, so within these male and female groups, 12 were fed a rodent chow diet, which is consistent with a balanced diet. Uh, 12 were fed the high fat, high sucrose diet, which mimics that of a Western diet. So 39% of the calories came from fat and 43% came from sugar. Um, and then the last group were fed the high fat, high sucrose diet for three weeks, and then were supplemented um, with a 10% oligo fructose fiber for the remainder of the study. And so this diet intervention went on um, until the rats were 24 weeks of age. And at this time, uh, the animals were sacrificed and tissues were harvested for analysis. And so now looking a little bit more specifically at uh, the type of data that I collected and will be analyzing, um, there are certain types of data that I collected um, kind of over the life lifespan of these animals. So during the study intervention, and then there's other data um, more involved with the tissues, the tissue analysis um, that is kind of currently being collected um, after the point of sacrifice of the animals. So something we look at is body composition and we do this um, using a DEXA scan. And so we take DEXA scans um, at the, at when the animals are 12 weeks old at the start of the high fat, high sucrose diet. And then again at 24 weeks old uh, to see how body um, composition changes throughout the duration of the study. We also look at um, a weight or mass gain. Um, and so animals were weighed at the beginning of every week throughout the duration of the study. Um, and then in terms of muscles, uh, this is uh, something that we looked at post, um, like after the intervention. So after the animals were sacrificed, so we harvested both the vastus lateralis and soleus muscle. Um, and the reason why uh, we chose these two muscles is because when uh, the vastus lateralis is a more glycolytic muscle and the uh, soleus is more oxidative. So we're interested in looking at the difference between the two. And so once the muscles are harvested, um, we flash freeze them in liquid nitrogen and then store them in the minus 80 freezer until um, we're ready to use them. And so what we do with these muscles after is we put them on the cryostat and section off. Um, we um, cut sections of the muscles and put them on microscope slides um, so that they're able to be stained for different types of analysis. And so one of the first uh, stains that we do is a uh, fat stain for fat content. Um, and this is called an oil red stain. So 
even these pictures are a little bit small, but you can see everything um, that's red here on the muscle sections um, is indicates fat content. Uh, another stain that we do is um, for collagen content analysis, and this is the Picrocerus red stain. Um, and so again, in this image, anything that is stained red indicates collagen content. And then another analysis we do using these um, muscle sections on microscope slides is a uh, analysis for local inflammation, looking at uh, macrophage cells. Uh, so we use immunohistochemistry to um, look at CD68 inflammatory cells, which gives us an idea of that local inflammation. And we also look at gut microbiota. So this, um, so throughout the duration of the study, I was collecting fecal samples every three weeks to be analyzed. And then um, at the tissue harvest, we also uh, collected a cecal matter as well as other gut tissue um, to be analyzed later. Um, another uh, analysis that we'll be doing is muscle proteomics. Um, and this is kind of a, a new, um, a new type of analysis uh, that our lab hasn't done before. So what we're hoping to understand here with proteomics is um, kind of the large scale study of proteomes and looking at um, understanding more of the mechanistic pathways involved in this diet induced obesity model of musculoskeletal degeneration. And this is something that I mentioned is, is new to us and we're excited to, to learn more about. Um, and then finally, uh, we are analyzing metabolic profile data as well. So we're looking at a blood lipid analysis and insulin, insulin sensitivity analysis. Um, and these are from uh, blood samples that were collected at 12, 15, and 24 weeks, and also um, oral glucose tolerance tests that were done at the same, around the same time point. And so now I'm gonna take you through some of the results that I've collected so far. Um, and these results that I'm presenting today are really going to help with answering um, the question, um, my first specific aim. So determining whether um, the effects of a delayed, or determining the effects of a delayed uh, dietary fiber intervention on muscle integrity. And so I'll be we'll be looking at results um, from the male rats and we'll go through some body composition data, body weight, um, we'll look at fat infiltration in the vastus lateralis muscle, and then finally um, take a look at the uh, blood lipid analysis. And so the first graph I'm going to show you here um, is the weight tracking results throughout the duration of the study. Um, here, the, this line displayed on this graph is, is the control animals. Uh, this red line here represents the animals on the high fat, high sucrose diet. Um, we can see here that by the end of the uh, study, there was a significant difference in between the weights of the control and the high fat, high sucrose diet animals, which was to be expected. Um, and then this green line in the middle is the, um, the weight tracking for the um, high fat, high sucrose animals with that fiber intervention. So this is the time point here where that fiber intervention was um, introduced. And so what is interesting to me here is that the rate of weight gain um, before that fiber intervention was similar to that of the animals in the high fat, high sucrose group. Um, however, after the fiber intervention, um, it's more similar to uh, the control group as it kind of follows the same trend. Um, and then again, uh, there was a statistically significant difference in weight between all of these groups at the end of the study. And so the next thing we're going to look at um, is body fat percentage. So I have these um, images here of the DEXA scans that were done um, at both 12 weeks of age and 24 weeks of age to see how the body composition changes throughout the duration of the study. Um, we can see here in the high fat, high sucrose group, the when comparing the, the animal at baseline to 24 weeks of age, it gained a considerable amount of body mass. Um, but when looking at the 
um, fiber intervention group and the control group, uh, it, they kind of both maintained their size. Uh, so when looking at the body fat percentage results that we got from the DEXA scans, um, we found that the chow animals had the lowest percent percentage of body fat. Um, the high fat, high sucrose group had the highest. Um, and then the high fat, high sucrose group with the fiber diet intervention was in the middle. And so again, all of these um, percentage of body fats ended up being significant, um, significantly different at 24 weeks of age. So at the end of the study. Um, so this kind of indicates that although the amount of body fat accumulated wasn't as much as the high fat, high sucrose group, it still wasn't as, um, it wasn't protected to the same extent um, as the chow group. And so these images on this slide are looking at the amount of intramuscular fat in the vastus lateralis muscle. And so again, these were stained with the oil red O histological stain. And so anything that's stained red in these images um, indicate intramuscular fat. And so we can see here that uh, this section of muscle is from a chow animal and there was not a lot of red staining indicating not a lot of intramuscular fat. However, when looking at the uh, animal with on the high fat, high sucrose diet, there's a lot um, of red staining, so a lot of intramuscular fat. Um, and then looking finally at the uh, group on the high fat, high sucrose diet with the fiber diet, delayed fiber diet intervention, um, we can see some red staining, but it's still not, not as much as the purely high fat, high sucrose group animal. And so what we saw um, kind of visually on the last side, slide, we can see, we saw when we quantified these, um, the, the amount of intramuscular fat. And so again, it's kind of followed the same, same trend as with the body fat percentage. The chow group had the lowest percentage of intramuscular fat and the high fat, high sucrose group had uh, the highest. And then uh, again, the fiber group um, intervention group was somewhere in the middle. And again, all of these um, results were significantly different than each other. And so here on this slide, we're looking at blood lipid data by looking at serum triglyceride levels. Um, and what I want to draw attention to here is kind of the um, increase in um, serum triglyceride at um, from 12 weeks to 24 weeks of age. Um, at 15 weeks of age, we know that the high fat, high sucrose, both of these uh, groups were just purely on the high fat, high sucrose group. So um, it, we expected it to be higher. However, when um, looking at the data at 24 weeks of age, um, only the high fat, high sucrose group um, had a significantly higher um, amount of serum triglycerides than the chow group. Um, and the fiber group was more similar to uh, the chow group. And so with, um, with these results, um, we can say that the, there was an obvious um, difference between the, um, the group that uh, received the fiber diet intervention um, compared to the high fat, high sucrose group. So the fiber uh, did still have a protective effect on body fat accumulation as well as intramuscular fat infiltration. However, as we saw um, on those graphs um, in the results, there it still wasn't, um, it was still significantly higher than that of the chow group. Um, so this kind of suggests to me that the delayed um, dietary intervention may not be able to um, revert that damage that had been done on the first three weeks of the high fat, high sucrose diet. Um, as I mentioned, mentioned before, um, changes to muscle structural integrity can be seen as early as three days after the start of a high fat, high sucrose diet. Um, so it's possible that maybe the fiber didn't um, kind of revert any of the damage that was done, but maybe it just uh, stopped it or paused it. Um, and so something that I'd like to do is to investigate the changes in muscle integrity at three weeks following a high fat, high sucrose diet. We have a data set that um, has uh, muscle integrity data 
um, at around three weeks after a high fat, high sucrose diet. And I would use this to compare, um, compare that to the group that received the, um, the three weeks on the high fat, high sucrose diet, and then the nine week uh, fiber diet supplementation. And so just to talk a little bit um, more about the fiber, um, based off previous studies that I had, had talked about, we can speculate that um, the prebiotic fiber diet supplement did induce that change in the gut microbiota that um, reduced the inflammation, which then protected against um, the body fat accumulation and intramuscular fat infiltration. Um, however, we will need to analyze um, our own gut microbiota and inflammation data for this model to be able to confirm that it is um, valid here. And so just um, kind of in conclusion to wrap, to wrap that up, um, we can conclude that fiber does have at least some of a protective effect against the accumulation of um, body fat and intramuscular fat infiltration and that that three week delayed prebiotic fiber diet intervention is still within that critical timeline um, where it can have a protective effect um, against uh, um, a degeneration in the uh, muscle integrity. And then finally, I'll just leave you with some of the next steps um, to my project. Um, for the male rats, um, as I kind of talked about earlier, there is a link that is speculated to exist between that intramuscular fat and fibrosis. So my next step um, with those is to quantify the intramuscular um, collagen content um, of the same muscles. So of that vastus lateralis muscle that I um, talked about the um, fat infiltration data for, and then um, then after that would be to look at the soleus muscle and see how, how that muscle compares with the vastus lateralis. Um, and then with the female rats, um, I had these, these rats undergoing um, their diet intervention kind of in the winter and we harvested their tissues uh, at the end of April and early May. And so um, I will begin to start looking at their body composition um, and weight analysis um, and weight data um, to do that analysis and then um, also start to quantify the intramuscular fat and collagen of the vastus lateralis and soleus. And uh, I currently have a, a summer student who, who is starting to work on that. So hopefully we'll have um, some of those results shortly. And so with that, um, I just want to uh, acknowledge my lab for the help, help and support um, during my research project so far, and a uh, special thank you to Dr. Herzog for the opportunity to work on this project. And uh, with that, I will open the floor to any questions. Um, I, will ask, I will now ask Hannah to please stop sharing her screen. I kindly encourage any audience members who are comfortable to please turn on their Zoom cameras to allow for a better discussion. You can ask a question using the raise hand function under reactions, or you may type your question in the chat box and I will read it aloud. Um, I can get started. Um, so I was wondering if you could elaborate on why the diet was started at week 12 instead of earlier or before. Yes. Um, so we started the diet um, at week 12 because this is kind of uh, at that time the rats are mature. Um, so they're not uh, they're not in the stage kind of where they're developing. They've kind of developed um, their weight has started to kind of stable uh, stabilize. Um, and so that's why we started the diet at 12 weeks of age. Okay. Um, Hart, if you could please go ahead. I enjoyed your talk. Um, <clears throat> in, in your slides, the slide right before the start of the discussion, uh, three lines. Pull that up. Yes. Um, in line, lower than the red line, even before you start the intervention. Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, that's a good 
good question. Um, so we did the best um, that we could to randomize um, the rats into different groups. And so there was no significant difference at this time. Um, so statistically, they were very similar to each other. Um, and it's kind of the same as, as with people. Um, rats are heterogeneous in nature. So there are, um, I guess, like differences between them. And so just within the groups, um, it should, it, um, we tried to randomize it so it would even out, but it just um, seemed to be that there was just a couple lower, lower ones in the um, group that received the fiber diet intervention. But statistically speaking, they, there was no significant difference between the groups. Okay. <laughs> um, get rid of the slides. Um, the, the point about effectiveness, uh, Bacalini's study where she started at the same time as the diet, it, it seems that the, <clears throat> the, um, the fiber can compete effectively when they're started at the same time, but once they're start, it's delayed, it can't compete any longer. Um, is that also found in other species? Uh, I mean, I know Raylene has <clears throat> done some studies in humans uh, with this, uh, and was it effective in humans, uh, people with obesity? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I haven't, I haven't really looked into um, whether it, whether the delayed um, fiber intervention uh, is effective in humans. Um, I've read a couple of studies just of, um, just looking at like people's diets in general, um, whether they have um, just more fiber in their diet. So they've kind of taken um, a survey of like what, what people eat and the people who do typically have a higher fiber intake do generally have lower obesity, but I'm not, I not, I can't comment on um, a delayed fiber intervention um, in humans at the time, at this time. Okay, thank you. Walter, please go ahead. Oh, why don't I go next uh, if, if nobody else wants uh, tons of questions? Thanks, thanks a lot. That was uh, that was very interesting. Um, the the first thing that I think uh, just just to uh, make sure that everybody understands is I think you never you know you showed uh, several slides with Mankin scores. I don't think you ever really explained what the Mankin score is, and there's a lot of people here that uh, that don't really do that. Could you maybe just quickly uh, explain how you obtain that and what it means and, and those type of things? Sure. Um, so the Mankin scores um, are scores of knee joint damage. So these, this in this graph here, I'll see if I can um, zoom in a little bit. Um, so the Mencken scores that uh, Walter's referring to are scores of knee joint damage. Um, and so what it, um, what it looks at is the kind of the cartilage degeneration and um, joint degeneration within, um, within the joint. And so in this study specifically, we're looking at knee joints. Um, and so a joint that would receive a higher score is one that, um, exhibits more joint degeneration. So this uh, joint here um, the, from the high fat, high sucrose animal um, has a higher um, Mankin score. Whereas these, these joints that look more clean, um, smooth, uh, nice articular cartilage, um, they receive a lower score. Um, and so as seen, seen here, um, and then just kind of to explain this image um, in terms of this graph, like we, we see that um, these, these joints, um, that were, um, that were from animals that were subjected to that, um, dietary or exercise intervention, um, 
they received low and comparable um, making, making scores to the Chow group. So this indicated that it, um, these interventions rescued, rescued these joints. Yeah, thanks. And the other, the other question that I had, you know, since, since you talk, we are talking about joints, um, do you have any, you talked all about muscles. Do you have any results already about the knee joint that you can share? Or if not, what would you expect? Would you expect uh, the knee joints to behave essentially? And, and other tissues, ligaments and tendons and menisci, would you think that they behave in a similar way as the muscle? Would you think they behave very differently? Well, what's, your, what's your speculation on that? Um, in terms of the male animals, um, I can speculate that the knee joints from uh, the animals that have the delayed dietary fiber intervention, um, I would speculate that they're, they could receive um, some sort of damage. Um, Muscle tissue in general is, has a higher regenerative capacity um, compared to bone and cartilage. So um, because they are susceptible, like, or I guess um, they have the same, uh, they're in, in the same environment um, with the same uh, amount of inflammation as the muscles, um, they, could experience some of that damage due um, to that inflammation. However, the muscles uh, might have a higher capacity to regenerate, whereas joints don't. And so I would almost expect to see more um, joint degeneration, especially with the males. In terms of the females, um, I don't know if I can quite speculate on, on that yet. Um, so I haven't seen any um, of the data from the muscles yet we're just working on getting that done so i'm not quite sure that would actually be interesting because uh, you mentioned a study by kelsey collins where she found within days and, and a couple of weeks she found changes in the um, uh, in, in the muscles you know um, fat infiltration a little bit of fibrosis and i assume after a few days you wouldn't really see anything in the joint so if your speculation is right, that after 24 weeks, after the 12 week period, your joints will be worse than the muscles. That means at the beginning, likely the joint, the, the muscles will be worse than the joints. I, I would speculate, although I don't know that. So somehow they would have then to reverse if your speculation is correct. So then the question becomes, when do you think that that, that change would be occurring? <clears throat> that, would be, that would be interesting. Um, the, um, maybe I can unshare so I see when somebody sure. holds up their hands because I have a ton of questions and I'm just going to go on if nobody else, if nobody else does. Uh, the, the other thing that, uh, that I thought was interesting, and I see Dave is holding up his hand, so I'm, I'm just going to ask this question and then step aside. Um, the other thing I was interested in, you know, when you also went back to the um, intervention study uh, from previous uh, students where we did the exercise intervention, um, then the animals on the high fat sucrose diet plus the exercise intervention, they still gained a lot of fat and they were still, you know, bigger and heavier and more fat accumulation than the animals just on, on the chow diet that did not exercise. And, um, and that's, that's a bit surprising to me. And I wonder, maybe you can uh, tell us what that exercise intervention was and if in your opinion that is a, a mild exercise intervention or a heavy intervention or a super elite athlete intervention <clears throat> um so from what i um remember reading the exercise intervention is just was was i think it was 30 minutes um 30 minutes a day five days a week um on on a treadmill um for these for these rats and it wasn't at a super high speed or anything they were just kind of walking along um, and this, uh, yeah, went on five days a week um, for these animals. And in terms of inter exercise, like I guess intensity of exercise, I wouldn't say um, it is a, a very intense um, exercise. I think it's more of a moderate um, intervention, um, but definitely enough 
to see that change um, like in the metabolic uh, profile data um, as they were metabolically healthier um, than the animals um, on the high fat, high sucrose diet. They didn't gain as much weight as the animals on the high fat, high sucrose diet, um, but they were significantly metabolically healthier um, when compared to those animals, even with the, the uh, fat gain. So if you ha had housed the rats in a, in a cage where there is freely a uh, running wheel available, um, what, what do you think the rats would be doing? Would they do about the same amount, five times a week, about 30 minutes? Would they do less? Would they do more? Um, that's a, a good question. Um, just based off of like my experience with uh, handling the rats, um, I, would, I would say they might do more um, just on their own. They're quite active animals. Um, usually when I, uh, when I went in there to um, collect data or perform tests, they were, they were quite, they were quite active, especially um, the, the younger, what, like kind of like earlier on in the intervention. Um, however, I did find now that I'm, I'm talking about this, uh, once they started to gain weight due to the, um, the high fat, high sucrose diet, they were um, a little bit less active. So I guess it, I don't, I don't know if, if they were subjected to the same diet, if they would, um, be as, as active as they would have, would have, would be when forced, um, to walk on a treadmill for, for 30 minutes, um, every day, five days a week. That, um, that, that would actually, that would actually be an interesting study, uh, yeah. to, to have them, uh, you know, have a freely, uh, available, a running wheel and then see as they get bigger and bigger, if they do get bigger and yeah. bigger with the wheel available with the high fat sucrose diet, uh, if that would then uh, indeed, as you speculate, result in a, in a, in a decrease in the, in the running capacity mm -hmm. or in the running uh, willingness. But, but you're right, not only do they run more uh, rats, you know, we have never done that, but when you read the literature, rats, rats run an enormous amount. They run hours every night three, four hours every night. So half an hour on a treadmill at a relatively moderate speed is, you know, had an interesting effect metabolically, but for these animals, that's actually very, very little exercise to what they naturally would do uh, if you let them. So I'll, I'll, I'll go away here and uh, let all the people chat. Just make a comment on, on that point. Years ago, I did a study on mice and, um, mice running freely on a wheel at nighttime would travel um, many kilometers as ticked over by the rotations of the wheel. And when we had them as obese mice, they'd be lucky to turn the wheel over once a night. <laughs> Just one turn. <laughs> I guess that there's the answer. Eh? <laughs> the, the question though is uh, if they were, uh, if they had a freely uh, available wheel, you know, and they had the bad diet, the high fat sucrose diet, would they actually get fat or would they run so much? You know, it, it's, it's like, you know, if you run four hours a day, if you're a human being, you run four hours a day, I think you can eat whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, you're just going to be skinny. You know, this <laughs> is uh, so, uh, but anyway, you, you, your joints might be going, but, uh, but anyway, uh, I, I, this I'm is stopping. This is off topic, but uh, I put this, this nature paper in the chat just because I thought it was interesting. Um, if you put those running wheels in the middle of the forest, wild mice will in fact use them. So <laughs> actually oh, a natural, the it's like a natural voluntary behavior in these animals. They love running on these wheels. Anyway, it's an interesting study. Yeah, yeah that, that Sorry, is really interesting. No, no, that's I didn't know that. No, that's, I think it's, it's very relevant. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm stopping now too. Um, I'm just going to read this question out from the chat box. Um, it's a, just a general question, but what is the nutritional content of the chow? Is it all the nutrients the rat would need to grow, i.e. daily requirements? I want to know the difference between the chow and the other two diets. Is it just that more fiber was added to the original amount or high sucrose to the original? Um, so off the top of my head, I can't um, remember the nutritional content of the chow, but it is designed um, to give all of the nutrients that a rat would 
need um, to maintain a to maintain their health. Um, in terms, and so you said you wanted to know the difference between the chow and the other two diets. Um, so is it just that? Um, I'm not 100% sure if I follow um, your question, but in terms of the other two diets, so the high fat, high sucrose diet and the chow and the um, high fat, high sucrose diet with the fiber diet intervention, um, these, the fiber diet intervention, so we just added like a 10% um, fiber supplement to this diet. So based on weight, um, I would weigh out the amount of high fat, high sucrose diet and then add that 10% of the fiber and mix it all together. So it was all um, mixed well. Um, and so, yeah, we added the fiber to the high fat, high sucrose diet. It wasn't like a different, um, a different diet. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question, um, but if you want to chat more about that later, I can maybe hopefully understand your question a little better. Um, Benno, if you would like to ask your question. Oh, I saw. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering how your setup relates to reality. I mean, in reality, you don't start eating a high fat diet and 12 weeks later you do something as an intervention. In reality, you have a lifelong high fat diet and then you start doing something. So how does your setup of the experiment relate to something that happens in reality? Um, so, I am not, um, I'm not a hundred percent sure, I guess, how it, um, relates to reality. I know that studies, um, like what you're saying in, in, about how it's a lifelong, um, eating the high fat, high sucrose diet. Um, I know some previous studies in our lab, um, have looked at the effects of like introducing this diet earlier. Um, and I can't, um, I'm not a hundred percent, um, confident on the results of that study, but I know, um, I think that there was a sort of an adaptation, um, to the high fat, high sucrose diet that once these rats were a little older, they weren't as metabolically affected by the diet, um, in terms of how my study relates to, um, kind of like a real life scenario it, it doesn't, I guess, because yeah, you wouldn't just start all of a sudden eating a high fat, high sucrose diet one day, but there is potential, um, I guess, um, in the model, um, just thinking of from a kind of a personal standpoint that when I was younger and I guess before I became an adult, I ate the food that my parents made for me. Um, now being older, I have to make myself food or I have to buy myself food and it might not always be the healthiest choices. So that could be kind of how, um, this, this model relates to kind of a real, real life scenario, but you are definitely correct in, in saying that it is more likely that it's more of a lifetime, um, a lifetime diet of the high fat, high sucrose. Um, hearts, if you would like to. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I couldn't hear. So if, you, if you want to translate what you found and tell somebody what to do, or how can you do that? Let's um, say I you, guess you you found the result. Can you then tell somebody based on that result what to do? I guess based off my result, I I wouldn't. I'd feel confident that there's there's some data supporting supporting it, but it also um, it is a, a preclinical study, so pretty pretty basic basic science. So definitely a more clinical clinical study would be able would be important to be able to kind of translate this knowledge um, into actual recommendations for for people. Thank you.
maybe just just to add to that, obviously uh, that uh, you know Raylene uh, has started such a study together with Rafael Fortuna, where we are involved and where 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 exactly that model, you know, is a fiber diet supplementation in people with mild to moderate osteo knee joint osteoarthritis and simultaneous obesity. Uh, you know, if, if that if that fiber diet supplement actually helps, uh, you know, potentially delay the the the, you know, the progression, the rate of progression of osteoarthritis. So, although we are not doing that, uh, you know, Raylene uh, together with us somehow, and I think Dave Hart is involved as well uh, in some of these studies. So, so there is studies that try to translate some of the you know more mechanistic pathways uh, and see if that works in humans as well. I had a couple of follow-up uh, comments, I guess. Um, one, I, I think uh, the additional group that you alluded to in one of your later slides, that you need a group that you put on the high fat, high sucrose diet for three weeks and then sacrifice them to find out where the rats are actually at at three weeks is critical um, for the proteomic uh, work. Um, but it also, uh, help you decide whether the intervention um, is able to reverse the first three weeks or it just stops disease progression. If it stops progression, and I think your data is, that you have so far is more in line with stopping progression as opposed to reversal, then it would influence the expectations of using this intervention on uh, people who, who <clears throat> have obesity for a long time, you might be able to stop progression, uh, perhaps uh, the type two diabetes or some of the hypertension and some aspects of the inflammation, uh, but they shouldn't have expectations that they're gonna turn into thin people again, uh, just based on that one intervention. I think that group that you alluded to critical uh, for interpreting your study. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. I am hoping to, to take a closer look at that. Um, maybe after after the summer is over, after I get through some of the female female data. Because yeah, I agree. I think it's very, very important, especially yeah, what you said with the, what the data looks like so far is that it doesn't, it looks like there could be um, just not a not a re revertation back to normal, just a pause on where things are at. Because, I mean, I think it's also important because uh, my bet is that there may be inhibition of um, development of the, the joint damage uh, because the joint damage uh, may be a later consequence of early events. Um, mm -hmm. so, could stop that. So um, that group and, and, and the results you get from that group would be very informative uh, uh, in your interpretation. Definitely. Robert, if you would like to go ahead, please. And then could you put up the one of the early slides? I think it was the graphs of weight gain um, showing from 12 weeks through to 24 weeks. Because yes. I'm, I'm not sure if I read it correctly. It looked like the biggest impact was in those between 12 weeks and 15 weeks. And then from 15 weeks to 24 weeks, they were all essentially on the same trajectory. Yeah, um, I, I, do, I agree with that. I do, I think there, especially with the, with the chow um, control group, I do think there wasn't quite the same rate of weight gain, but you're definitely correct about the first three weeks. So I think this could be a very like important like critical time time point um, to look at um, with like the changes that happen in those first three weeks because 
it definitely they they did still gain um like each group gained quite a bit of weight they all gained on on a somewhat similar trajectory and if you if you brought them all together at, at week 15 i'm not sure that you would see a significant change between the three different interve interventions yeah, at week, week 15, there was still not um, a significant difference between, between weight um, at week 15. Yeah. Uh, um, on a, another issue, in looking at the impact of this on muscle, you, you said that um, the high fat, high sucrose uh, had an increase in intramuscular fat and fibrosis. Uh, I'm just wondering what impact that actually has on muscle, because I know in sheep, there are some sheep that store their fat within the muscle. There are some sheep that store their fat in a fat body between the muscle. And there's another breed of sheep that stores their fat in their tail independently. Mm -hmm. But um, many sheep store the, the fat within the muscle. And so when you said that the, the um, high fat, high sucrose diet led to an increase in intramuscular fat and fibrosis. I, I'm wondering since the, I think the object was what's the impact of this on muscle, then that's an observation, but is there anything to see, to show whether this has changed the performance of the muscle? I could see, you know, an enzymatic change, and that shouldn't be too difficult to reverse. But intrinsically, what does fat inside the muscle, what impact does that have? And I'm not sure that it would have any. Uh, and fibrosis, it, it might increase the, the passive element in the muscle. But, but you, are you intending to take these muscles and at the end of this and, and then do some some basic muscle physiology to say that the, you know the muscle is is poorer for some reason i'm just not sure what impact functionally it's had on the muscle what do you think yeah so um functionally um fat infiltration in muscle can lead to like decreased muscle strength and force production. So that's kind of the, like how it, it limits it in the physical function. Um, and then also muscles also a very, like a very big glucose regulator. Um, and so once kind of the muscle tissue um, is infiltrated by fat and kind of undergoes fibrosis, it's not able um, to utilize um, that glucose as efficiently. So then the insulin sensitivity goes down, um, which then I guess also increases, um, increases fat, um, which then again, um, increases inflammation, which also kind of triggers the muscle to gain more fat. So it's also kind of, it has the metabolic function as well is decreased um, with the um, addition of intramuscular fat and fibrosis. So are you um, but, looking to make some of those measurements down the track then? Um, for the scope of my project, I'm not um, looking at making uh, kind of the uh, measurements um, of like muscle strength and con contractile force um, just within the scope of this project. I think it, it should, it's something that's important and I should be, should be investigated. Um, but in terms of kind of the physiological function of the muscle, we will be looking um, kind of at uh, insulin sensitivity and how that's affected by um, intramuscular fat infiltration. Right, right. And, and uh, you, did you have an inflammatory indicator as well? Um, we'll definitely be taking a look at uh, local inflammation within the muscle using a, like a macrophage analysis. Um, in terms of systemic inflammation, I, we've collected, um, like serum for that and hopefully we'll be able to get it, um, analyzed by the time kind of my, my project is wrapping up. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Anna. Thank you.
I'm just going to read another question from the chat. Um, also wanted to ask you if you know if this effect is only seen with high sucrose or is it found with other disaccharides such as maltose or lactose? Um, that's another good question. And um, I, I am not sure that's something that I, um, I need to look into. Um, I guess it would depend on how how that, um, how I guess the gut, gut um, reacts to the maltose or lactose um, as opposed to sucrose, but I'm not, I'm not sure um, at this time, I'll have to look into that. Um, Sophia, please go ahead. Hi, Hannah, thanks so much for your talk. It was awesome to hear about your research. Um, just throughout the talk, while you were talking about previous work in the Herzog group and your ongoing project, I had some questions coming to mind that I don't know are necessarily in the scope of your project, so it's okay if you don't know the answer. But I was just wondering if there's a way in the RAP model to like determine how um, the mechanical consequences of obesity are also contributing to the joint degeneration and muscle changes. Um, so by mechanical um, consequences, do you mean um, like reduced force or like the um, like decreased ability to like move around? I was thinking specifically like increased weight gain. And then like, if you think about if there's more mass, mm -hmm. how would that affect forces going through the knee, for example? Right. Um, so yeah, there has been, uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I'm pretty sure there, there's been studies looking at knee joint, um, degeneration, um, in rats that have been, uh, size matched. Um, so when, so some of these, some of these rats, when you do a very large study, um, you can find that some are obesity prone and obesity resistant. So some just tend to gain more weight and some don't. Um, and so something that's been done is to kind of weight match these obesity resistant animals um, to the uh, control animals. So these animals will have similar weights, but one will still be on the high fat, high sucrose diet and one will be on the chow diet. Um, and so with, um, with, this, I know that they've compared um, like knee joint degeneration between the two and found that it was more related to the actual like metabolic dysfunctions um, than opposed to the actual weight gain of, of the animal. Cool, thanks so much. Um, Dave, please go ahead. Quick uh, question. Um, is there any effect of the fiber on uh, rats fed the chow? Um, that's not something uh, that I know that we haven't looked into, into that. Um, I haven't really looked around in the literature for that either, because I, I hadn't really thought about that before. Um, so I, that would be an interesting, um, control group though. And now that I'm, yeah, that would be an interesting control group. Um, I can't remember if in Jack Weenie's study, they had that as a control group. I know, yeah. Um, yeah, rats, I, I don't know. Rats in the wild probably don't eat chow. Um, so that, uh, and there's a, a tendency for us researchers to buy a diet. <laughs> from a supplier and um, uh, assume that that's the control uh, as opposed to what's normal. Right. Uh, and we all fall into that trap. Um, certainly rats seem to eat just about anything in the wild. Um, it would be interesting to see if indeed uh, of the fiber are unique to the high fat, high sucrose diet, mm -hmm. or also you see effects on uh, rats fed, uh, what we consider the, the control. Right. Yeah, that would be interesting. Walter, please go ahead. Yeah, just maybe a couple of things 
uh, to add some of the, some of the questions. So, so Dave, yeah, we have done all the child controls, uh, but not analyzed. But Jacqueline had child group uh, with fiber diet, uh, with exercise, and with the combination of the two. So, so those are data that, uh, that will need to be analyzed at one point, because I fully agree with you. I think that would be tremendously important to see uh, what that is. And then I forgot uh, who asked uh, about the functional implications. And, uh, and, and again, uh, that was done by uh, Graham McDonald, uh, has done a study like that, where he looked at the passive forces and the isometric, like the force length relationship. And uh, there were slight shifts in the passive and slight shifts in the active force length relationship, but the peak forces were about the same for so the peak isometric forces uh, were about the same. And then Ian Smith, uh, when he was a postdoc with us, he also did some, um, some single fiber work. And for a variety of reasons, that's very complicated as it turns out. But, uh, but essentially, there seemed to be little to no change in single fibers from fat animals compared to, uh, compared to um, the skinny animals. The slight problem there seems to be that in all muscle preparations that we have ever done and that anybody seems to be doing, muscle force always, you can always normalize it to cross-sectional area. And then you get a muscle stress and you can compare between fibers and between muscles. And for some reason, that does not seem to work in skin fibers. For some reason, you don't get a linear relationship between cross-sectional area of a skin fiber and force. And, and so that makes it a bit, that makes it a bit tricky. And, and Ian looked at that very, very carefully. And, um, and, and other people, there's, there's not many things out there, but there's about three or four publications out there that have commented on that as, as well. And I, I really have no clue why that would be. But, uh, but so we have looked at some functional properties, but not in this latest study uh, with Hannah and, uh, and Nada. Yeah. I have another question if nobody else is there. And um, so, you know, it seems to me there is uh, like three basic components in that animal model. And uh, one is the amount of fat, you know, just the body fat that you accumulate with the, with the diet. And then the other one is that metabolic disease and systemic inflammation uh, that comes about uh, in association with the fat. And then you also talked about, you know, very distinct changes in the gut microbiota that also result in lipopolysaccharide translocation through the gut and that messes up things. And so, so in your own mind, how do you, how do you think about the importance and the interconnection of the fat and the metabolic changes and um, and the gut changes, the gut microbiota changes? Um, so in my mind, um, I think it all kind of comes back to the, the metabolic changes. I think the um, the amount of, of body fat contributes to those metabolic changes, um, as well as the, the, um, relationship to the gut, um, contributes to the metabolic changes as like, um, as you mentioned, the, uh, kind of the, the infiltration of the, um, lipopolysaccharides into the blood, um, increases that systemic. Maybe, maybe sorry for, sorry for interrupting, but, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, as you answer I'm thinking about Giacolini's study, you know, where she showed that the animals that exercise and were on the, fi on the fiber diet with the high fat sucrose, they still had substantially more fat content, but metabolically they seem to be healthy. Yeah. So fat alone does not seem to regulate uh, the metabolic profile. There, there, there appear to be other factors at, at, at play as well. And uh, yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering, have you have you tried to kind of reconcile that in, in your own mind, or, mm -hmm. or or not really yet, or um, <clears throat> not not really yet? I haven't really gotten there yet. I guess just trying to like. There's a, yeah, there's a nice paper by Kelsey Collins in the Frontiers of Physiology where she has some conceptual diagram 
uh, how she thinks about how the how these things interact and mm-hmm. what the fiber diet intervention might do and what the exercise might be doing and it might be might might be good to be uh, to be you know aware of how other people think about it you know and then yeah you have to think about it in the same way but it might might give you a little bit um, you know a guidance and a little bit of framework against sure. which you can then uh, you know compare your results <clears throat> for sure just a very naughty question at the end here, I guess. You know, um, your oil red stains. If I take the median, the median difference was the median was roughly for the three groups: uh, 0.3, 1.2, and two. Oh, it's frozen. Can you hear me? So there's about a two percent into the middle, and and I know they were statistically significant. I guess I just have a how how confident um, are you in those um, in, do, in those results? And have you done uh, you know kind of a reliability test? And has these been evaluated by other blinded uh, assessors to see whether or not they come up with the same result? Have those type of things been done for that? Because the differences seem you know small. We are talking a fraction of a percent or a percent at most. Yeah, um, with. With the um, with the oil red O, we haven't yet uh, done kind of a blinded um, look at it. It was the we who analyzed it did know kind of which which group. So um, the my confidence um, in the in the result is as I guess as I was one of. The people who were um, who who analyzed it just looking visually at the results as well as quantifying in image J. Like I was quite confident with them. There was um, like visually, I thought I saw um, differences between each group, and so the fact that they came out to be statistically significantly different, I wasn't I wasn't surprised um, in terms of a reliability test. Um, I haven't done one. Is is there one like is there a test that you suggest? Well, it, you know, uh, no, normally with the histological analysis, we have uh, two or maybe even three people look at it, like you know, but in a blinded fashion. Did I understand mm-hmm. that you were not blinded when you did that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. you know, that's 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 not gonna. That's not gonna be publishable. So somebody okay. uh, needs to be blinded that's trained in analyzing those things and has no clue what the groupings are and so right. so we need to find somebody who who kind of uh, does that um, uh, you know in a blinded manner at least one person better yeah. si- since you are not blinded it probably would be even better to have two people doing that independently and then see if they get them um, if they get the same results Right. Because I uh, w- would you agree, Dave, that that might be very hard to get across if you, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, 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 as okay. a reviewer, you know, if you tell me you're not blinded, I would be, uh, I'd be very skeptical, you know. So, for sure, yeah. No, that makes that makes lots of sense. At this point, I'd like to thank thank everyone for joining. Thank you to Hannah for her presentation and thank you to the audience members for their questions. I hope to see everyone back again next week. Thank you.